We're back at Mountain Gardens. Um, we've had an overview of what it, what the, the place is about, why, why Joe came here, what he did. We've looked at a tour. We've taken a tour and looked at the gardens. And now Joe is going to take us through a description of uh, a very brief <laughs> overview of Chinese medicinal herbal medicine. And then we're going to start through and do a, a medicinal uh, uh, workshop. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Joe. Okay, so uh, it's a big subject, and we only got about an hour, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> this is the book I mentioned earlier, in case any of you are interested, by this guy, Ron Teagarden, and he has started a restaurant specializing in these tonic herbs, and he's got a business and a presence on the Internet. Pretty good website. Uh, I like this book because it's the only one that goes into the, in depth into this health-promoting aspects of the herbs that I was talking about. The same herbs are used very much in Chinese medicine, but it's usually in terms of people that are sick enough to go to the doctor. So when it describes the use of some of these formulas, for instance, should have had this open to the page, but I didn't, but you can edit out this part while I look for it. There's a very famous uh, qi formula. I should mention that Chinese herbs are always used uh, in formulas, hardly ever used singly by themselves. It's usually formulas of half a dozen up to a dozen or even more herbs, and some of the elaborate tonics have maybe a hundred different things in them, uh, big amounts. So ah, I should have had this page open. I just wanted to read you about it. So there's a famous formula for tonifying the qi. The tonics, I'm going to talk particularly on the tonics because it's a category that's not really in Western medicine, Western herbal medicine even. It's big in Chinese medicine. These are like anti-aging is another way to think about it. It's also big in Ayurvedic medicine. They call them restoratives or rejuvenatives. Uh, but Western herbal medicine didn't really have this category very well developed at all. So there's, uh, <clears throat> these tonics are divided into four categories, qi tonics or energy tonics, blood tonics, and then tonics for the yin of various organs, tonics for the yang of various organs to keep those balanced. Uh, so I just wanted to use as an example a formula called Four Gentlemen. A lot of these formulas are ancient. They might be a thousand years old or, or even longer. You know, and the books will usually cite the the work in which that formula originally appeared. So the Four Gentlemen is, uh, is the basic uh, unit for tonifying energy, qi, and, in, and particularly for the spleen, which is shorthand for the whole digestive system. It's one of the five elements. The five elements equate to the five major organ systems, the heart, the lungs, the liver, the kidneys, and the... Something else. Uh, so the spleen represents the whole digestive system. These organs, when they say the liver, they don't just mean the liver because the liver connects to certain acupuncture channels and through that it's connected to the eyes. So you treat the eyes through the liver. Every one of these organs, every sense organ is connected to one or another of those internal organs in this way of thinking. And the herbs are categorized, among other things, they're categorized by the flavor, by the temperature, and by what organ systems they enter. So these are spleen tonics, and the reason <clears throat> that they are energy tonics is because we get our energy from food. That's where qi comes from, is from food and air. That's how we bring it into our body. Uh, so to increase the amount of energy you have, you want to increase the efficiency of your lungs and your digestive system so that you get the most out of your food and the most out of the air. You also want to eat good food, obviously, and breathe clean air. But. So this formula is called Four Gentlemen, and it's got four herbs in it. Ginseng is the lead herb. And a second herb that's another important spleen tonic called a tractalus, not yet very well known in this country, sort of a thistle-like herb. It's the root. And then uh, licorice, and in this case it's uh, licorice that's been fried with honey and processed to make it go more to the spleen. So of these five elements, uh, they have all sorts of associations. 
This is like the kind of thinking you find in many parts of the world, like Mandela thinking. You know, with the American Indians, it's northeast, southwest, and they associate everything with that. Uh, in Chinese, it's five elements. So each element has an associated season, a direction, a color, an emotion, a sense organ, a flavor, on and on. Uh, with the spleen, the color is yellow, and then frequently the herbs are yellow, but not always. Uh, and the flavor is sweet. So a lot of these tonics actually taste pretty good, as you'll see presently. Uh, licorice being the sweetest of all. And then if you fortify it some more by processing it with honey, that's directing it even more to the spleen. So that's the thinking there. And then the third one is actually a mushroom, a giant underground fungus called Fu Ling, which is very good for uh, draining dampness. One of the thing, ways the Chinese think about the function of the spleen is you're, it's like cooking your food, right? And then the energy kind of floats up out of this cauldron of the stomach. Uh, so even though it's wet in there, the, the feeling is that the spleen suffers from wetness. Too much dampness can put out this fire. So one of the pathologies of the spleen is that it's too damp. You're not draining out enough moisture in your fire isn't really cooking your food well enough. It's all metaphorical, but it all works. <laughs> uh, very, it's almost like poetry, some of it, the way that the kind of thinking. So I just wanted to compare with you uh, this four gentlemen decoction. So the description is pallid complexion, low and soft voice, reduced appetite, loose stools, weakness in the limbs. And then it goes on to say the body of the tongue is pale and the pulse is deficient and or frail. The Pulse and tongue diagnosis are the two biggest uh, things that a Chinese doctor uses to diagnose your condition. Although a good Chinese doctor, you walk in, say hi, sit down, he knows what's wrong with you. Right? Just by your complexion, your tone of voice, the way you're presenting yourself, everything else. Uh, so that's a description of this formula, right? But this formula is used by bodybuilders. This formula is used by people who want to gain muscle mass. Like if you want to get close to steroids but not take steroids, this is, this is one of the better things you can actually use. You know, so it's just two different perspectives of how to look at, at these herbs and these formulas. So men are thought to suffer more from qi deficiency, women more from blood deficiency for sort of obvious reasons. But that's not, you know, women can have qi deficiency, men can have blood deficiency for sure. That's just kind of a generalization. But there's a comparable formula for women called the four substances decoction or four things soup, whatever you want to call it. Sometimes they'll use the word soup, sometimes they'll call it a decoction. A decoction is simply where you cook the herbs. That's why you could also call it a soup. And that's the typical way that a patient would consume these herbs in China, traditionally, is to boil them for maybe a half hour, 45 minutes. There's different systems. Sometimes you pour that off, add more water, boil it again, and combine. There's different ways to do it. Uh, so the four substance decoction, which is the basic unit for blood tonification, is four herbs. One is Romania, Chinese false foxglove. I've got that growing in the garden. Of the ones in the previous, I have three out of the, I don't have the mushroom. Uh, they can all be grown here. The second one is peony root, and that's just the common garden peony. That is a major Chinese medicinal herb, especially for a lot of women's formulas. And the skin is treated through the blood, so these are also used a lot in things for the skin, like even beauty formulas, of which there are plenty in Chinese medicine uh, for a nice complexion, radiance, you know, which has to do with blood circulation and blood reaching the extremities. So peony root, then dongwe, the angelica that I pointed out, is the third big one. And the fourth one is called uh, chuanxiang, Chinese lovage root. Lovage is the genus ligusticum. You all might have heard of osha root. That's a major, major medicinal herb from the Rockies. That's a ligusticum. The Chinese use several ligusticums. There's a native one, ligusticum uh, Canadense, which is by some folks known as boar hog root, and it's esteemed as an aphrodisiac, for what it's worth. And I'm, again, the only person on the internet selling that, so I'll get phone calls 
I usually know as soon as I pick it up. It, it has this reputation with kind of urban southern black people for some reason uh, who know about this as an aphrodisiac. And usually when certain people call up, I kind of know what they're going to ask for before they ask for it. So that's the blood tonic one. So you can put these together and you can get something called uh, eight ingredients pill or women's precious pill. It's a famous formula for tonifying chi and blood both simultaneously. Then you can add two more herbs to that, which would be astragalus and cinnamon. Astragalus is also rated as a spleen chi tonic. And astragalus is the number one herb for the building up what's called wei chi, which is a particular form of chi that circulates on the surface of your body as opposed to just traveling in the acupuncture meridians. Uh, this kind of circulates and it constitutes a defense layer against anything coming in. And it's also thought of in terms of regulating the opening and closing of the pores. So if you find yourself sweating at inappropriate times, you know, like, why am I sweating? It's cold. You know, it's like, but somehow I'm sweating or you're sweating at night. Uh, that could be a chi deficiency and astragalus would probably be one of the herbs that was used for that. So we can add to the uh, women's precious pills, or the eight precious ingredients, uh, astragalus and cinnamon, a very warming herb, also thought of as a yang tonic for the kidneys. And then we will get the great all-inclusive tonifying decoction. So the great all-inclusive tonifying decoction, I got right here. <laughs> we just made up these pills of it the other day. I'll pass them around. You can take one or two. These are the kind of pills you just chew them up. Uh, so I just wanted to give you an example because one of the two projects we're going to do this afternoon is to make some pills. But we're going to do a different formula. Uh, we're going to do a formula that's used for brains that overstressed by too much study. You just chew them up. I think these are great for any time I'm, uh, this is like concentrated food, really concentrated food. This is like trail mix, boom, uh, jacked up a few degrees. That's the all-inclusive decoction, which is the precious pills and two more important tonic ingredients added to that for a total of 10. And that's called the Great All-Inclusive Tonifying Decoction. And I could read the description of that, I suppose. So as medicine, uh, the indications for this all-inclusive great tonifying decoction are a wan complexion, fatigue, reduced appetite, dizziness, light, listlessness, uh, poor sleep, palpitations, spontaneous sweating, night sweats, cold extremities, spermatorrhea, pale tongue, and a thin, frail pulse. This is combined chi and blood deficiency. Um, it goes on. But uh, that's what it is as medicine. But, but, well, one way to think about it is you take this stuff ahead of time and then you ain't going to be like that, right? <laughs> you don't want to end up there. <laughs> But it really doesn't have, these are all, one of the things about the tonic herbs is that they're slow acting and that uh, they're very safe and that you can take them for a prolonged period of time. The most ancient book on Chinese medicine, the uh, Divine Husbandman's Handbook, classifies all the herbs into superior, inferior, and a sort of medium class. And so the superior ones are the tonics, which are slow acting. They add to the lightness of the body is one of the ways they always describe it. Uh, the ones that are really fast acting and have a dramatic effect, like when you're really sick with a fever or something and you want something to punch it out, that's the inferior category of herbs because those have some toxin in them. And that's the basis of their action is that they're fighting against some kind of invasion that you're having, you know, or they're having a really strong dramatic effect when you've gotten so deficient you need to really pump up. But the tonics are, and that's the same way the adaptogens are described in Western medicine, is they're slow acting and they have a normalizing function. 
So you can have uh, plants or medicines that say raise blood pressure, or you can have ones that lower blood pressure. So in both cases, that's kind of dangerous. If you take too much of one of those, you might. So, but what uh, these adaptogens do is they normalize, right? So they they bring your blood pressure to where it's supposed to be. Like that's why they're so safe. That's because they're not trying to push you in just one direction. They're trying to bring you to where you're supposed to be. So let's see, we could take a break at this point momentarily and uh, spend a few minutes inside the herb room, uh, quickly going over some of the herbs and how they're categorized. And then we'll come back and talk about the exact projects that we're going to do today, which is two, we're going to make up a weigh up some herbs and ma start making a tincture uh, for Will's knee primarily and we're going to make these study pills that's for the rest of us. Okay so here we are in my herb shop uh, just to show you around very quickly we have both tinctures and raw herbs uh, in here. When I harvest herbs, because I don't have so many of any one kind, and because of my difficulty in drying them, I will usually make a tincture. Uh, and a lot of these can be made directly from the fresh herbs. Occasionally it's better to dry it first a little bit, but I can manage that. So these are all single herbs, some Chinese, some Western. I'd say 95% of these maybe are herbs that I grew or gathered locally. There are a few that I really want to have to be able to combine with other things that I have to buy. So when I have to do that, I do, but I uh, much prefer to use the herbs I can gather or grow. And then all across the top, these are Chinese formulas for various purposes. A lot of them are longevity. Some of them are for catching a cold or not preventing yourself from catching a cold. Some of them are martial arts formulas uh, used by those kind of folks for training, as I mentioned. Uh, they go to different organ systems, so just a whole variety of things. They start way back here and go on around. Uh, Anti-stress, just the, the kinds of things most people want, insomnia, you know, different common complaints. So I try and make up the basic classic Chinese formula. And back here are herbs, and I said, as I said, these come mostly from China. Even though I'm growing the plants, I don't usually have enough to put in the bottles. Uh, that is peach seeds inside of peach seeds. It's a blood tonic. This is red peony root, a certain species of wild peony. I happen to be standing next to the blood tonics. This is Churcha red peony as opposed to the white peony, which I mentioned a minute ago that goes in, oh, it's already over here. Honghua, safflowers. I don't know how much you can see the color of those. Number of the herbs for blood, of course, obviously, the associated color with blood would be red. So a lot of the herbs happen to be red, but not all of them. So a Chinese herb shop, well, what, one of the things I was pulling these out for to just point out to you is just the, uh, the way the herbs are presented. You know, they're not all chopped and ground up. If you go into a health food store and you want to buy herbs, there's jars and jars of herbs. In some of them anyway, and it's all either black, well not black, uh, sort of brown or green, either powder or little chunks. And you really don't, you know, there's not much difference between any of it. With the Chinese, the processing is very nice. They do the least amount of slicing that they need, and it's been worked out over a long, long period of time how each one is prepared. There are names for the slices. There's three different thicknesses of slices. There's lemons, uh, melon slices where you go at a slight angle. There's bamboo leaf slices where you go at more of an angle. This is all specific to each herb, how it should be sliced, because you're trying to balance off getting the uh, active ingredients extracted, right? You wouldn't want to use whole roots. Uh, you'd have to cook them for a day before the moisture would even penetrate to the middle. On the other hand, if you powder them or, or even grind them up, you're immediately opening them up to being oxidized and losing their shelf life and so on. So it's a balance between that. The reason all the herbs we have in this country are cut and sifted is strictly for the convenience of manufacturers. There's nothing about, you know, they're sacrificing quality for other reasons. So you'll see, uh, there's a stragulus, for instance. 
uh, big thick slices. There's a yam root. So uh, there's just an aesthetic uh, level about working with these herbs that's extremely appealing to me, for one thing. Now, these are all arranged in a certain standard uh, format, which is the same way the Chinese Materia Medica is arranged, like this. So how would you arrange all these herbs on a shelf? Well, you could do it alphabetically, but they don't have an alphabet. So. But even so, uh, the way they are arranged is by what they do, which is a, a much better way to arrange herbs. Of course, all herbs, or many of them, can do several things, but you just pick the most important function. And there's a standard sequence of how they're arranged by what they do. So the first herbs are the ones that are called release the exterior, that's when you're catching a cold in the early stages, there's an invasion coming in. And I should say that in, in Chinese medicine, usually about 90% of the things that are wrong with people are internal imbalances due to poor lifestyle choices. But sometimes you can catch a cold, <laughs> and that's not your fault. That's like something came at you, which is usually called wind in Chinese medicine, an invasion of wind. It's a metaphorical way of speaking about something that comes in from the outside. Also, pains that move around in the body are thought of as wind. Uh, wind is one of the five pernicious influences. That the rest are hot and cold and wet and dry and wind. Uh, so these are herbs that release the exterior. They treat the invasion of wind and are divided into two halves, cold, wind cold and wind heat. That's for early stages of cold. Some, some are characterized more by chills, others more by fever. Uh, in one case, you'd have a white tongue coating. In another case, it would be yellow or bright red. There's various ways to discriminate between wind cold and wind heat. The ones that treat wind cold are warming herbs. The ones that treat wind heat are cooling herbs. Always with everything, the principle is balance, getting everything into balance. So, And this is the same with medicine the world over, really. If you have a fever, you treat it with cool herbs. <laughs> it's just kind of an obvious thing. So some of the lead herbs... Up here are cinnamon twigs, uh, the ephedra that I showed you down in the garden. That's usually in the greenhouse. That's generally the first uh, herb in the whole book. Cinnamon twigs, some very aromatic things like shizunapeta, Japanese catnip. Uh, this is one of the angelicas, biger. So these all release the exterior. They're also used for allergies. So a lot of these herbs can be specific for nasal congestion and red eyes due to uh, hay fever, a lot of allergies. Used a lot that way. And then the cold release the exterior herbs starts with mint. Uh, mulberry leaf, chrysanthemum flowers are important. A number of others. Kudzu is actually in there. Kudzu is a very, very important plant. Uh, that would also have to be on anybody's list of the ten most useful plants. but. Don't try and grow it in your garden. <laughs> but, you know, it's food, it's medicine, it's fiber, it's like everything you want. Uh, kudzu specifically is for uh, early stages of a cold which are, expresses a lot of neck tension. And they make the analogy to baby birds. So it's that kind of a thing going on with you where you, you find yourself going like this, trying to get rid of the knot in the back. That's kudzu. <laughs> uh, so then it progresses down. There's a whole series of them that are for getting rid of heat, heat and toxicity. And those would be used often for externally too, for skin eruptions, like any kind of red, hot thing going on in your skin that would be treated with these release the heat herbs. It gets into diuretics and... Uh, Herbs for constipation, releasing downwards. Some of them are strong purgatives. Then it goes down into a category of herbs that are about phlegm, getting rid of phlegm, so coughs and colds. Oh, there was one in here for wind damp. That equates to sort of rheumatism arthritis, and that's a lot of those herbs we're going to be using for what we're going to make for Will presently. Herbs for wind damp conditions. These are all for coughs, colds, phlegm. A lot of these are in the garden. Then it gets on into a category for uh, food stagnation, improves your digestion. 
This is a bunch of them that are about circulate, regulating the chi, which mainly means keeping the chi moving. Uh, if you don't have the chi moving, you get different problems. For instance, if it gets stopped up in your head, you get headaches. Chi can also sometimes go backwards, in which case you have vomiting. That's thought of as chi going in reverse. So your food's supposed to go down and keep going down. <laughs> if it comes back up, something's going backwards. All pain in Chinese medicine is thought to be due to stagnation. Something is not moving. It could be blood or it could be energy. Typically, it's one or the other of, of those. And so you want to get more circulation going. So the next category down, which is regulate the blood, is in two parts. One is to stop bleeding, and the other is to uh, promote the circulation of the blood. So a lot of those are also used for pain relieving, because you want to promote the blood moving. I mentioned a little bit about the processing of herbs when I talked about the honey fried licorice, but there's lots of other things that you can use to process. For instance, you can process herbs with vinegar. The reason for doing that would be that the sour flavor of vinegar is going to help carry that herb to the liver, the flavor of the liver being sour. Or you can use salt, the flavor of that goes with the kidney to help the herb go to the kidney. You can process for lots of other reasons, too, to reduce toxicity, to uh, subdue uh, nasty flavors, uh, or just to enhance the action of the herb in different directions. So for promoting the circulation of the blood, uh, you fry them in wine. Or basically, you sort of soak them in wine a little while and then fry them until they're dry. And wine, and you can imagine alcohol, it wants to evaporate and go up. So it's all metaphorical, and it all works. So you can think of that flowing up and out as like it's carrying the energy of the herb. They say it opens the collaterals and the, and the vessels. You know, so if you want to get some pain relief, you want to get the blood moving you know, to carry away the inflammatory things that are going on. So some of the herbs that we're going to use in the formula today have actually been wine fried, and we do that right here in the clinic. Uh, that's corridalis, actually. That's the number one pain-relieving herb in Chinese medicine. It's, um, I'm thinking that this herb is comparable to a native wildflower called squirrel corn, and I actually submitted it for testing against the corridalis. It's a dicentra, but dicentra and corridalis are like that. You know. uh, any of uh, that family have alkaloids that tend to be pain relieving. That's the poppy part of the, or it's the fumariaceae part of the poppy family, but pretty much everything in that family. Poppies being obviously the most well known pain reliever in the world. Uh, then let's see, yeah, so through the blood moving, the stop bleeding. Uh, there's some for relieving an internal cold internally warming like ginger and aconite. And then it finally gets these tonics that I've been talking about, and they start with ginseng. They start with the spleen tonics, then go to the blood tonics, then the yin tonics, and the yang tonics. Ginseng is the first of the uh, qi tonics. The codonopsis, which I mentioned out front, growing on the vine, is used commonly as a substitute. You can see these great big roots were just grown in a, a year or two. Uh, we've also got Zhihuang Chu, we've got the astragalus, and then this is honey prepared with astragalus. Again, I said honey takes it to the spleen. Uh, another important one is Dioscorea. This is on most uh, states' invasive exotics lists now. Evil <laughs> stuff. Uh, this is uh, Shanyao, it's Dioscorea batatis. It makes little aerial potatoes, tubers. Some people call it air potato vine in places where it's naturalized. But these are slices from the root. This is an example of many of these tonic herbs. You could just throw this into any soup or stew you were making. It tastes very bland. It just kind of soften up and disintegrate, and it would just help your digestion and help feed you a little better. There are a number of these tonic herbs that are like that. And if you go into a, a big place like the Grand Asia supermarket, you all know that one in Cary? Uh, they got a whole aisle of medicinal herbs. And people use them just for cooking. They're, you know, they're not 
people that are buying them are not doctors, but there's just common folk knowledge about certain herbs being good for certain things. And they will usually use them by putting them in chicken soup or something like that. Uh, that's the way they're typically ingested, a lot of these. And there, there'll be even mixes, famous, you know, four herb mix or a six herb or an eight herb mix. Let's see, we got fennel seeds there. Oh, we're going across here. There's the Attractylus. Jujube is a famous one. Jujube and licorice. Licorice is the most used of all Chinese herbs. It goes into almost all formulas. Not because it's uh, so powerful in itself, but it's got several things going for it. It's thought of as a conductor for the other herbs. Uh, so licorice, for one thing, it enters all five channels, so it can help convey the herbs to places that they might not go on their own. And then it uh, adds a nice flavor, sweet. It's usually the least number of grams of all the herbs is, would be the licorice. Uh, adds some sweet flavor, and it's also very good for food poisoning. So that could equate to lessening any possible negative side effects that the patient might have to a particular formula. So for all those reasons, it's frequently used but not uh, thought of as a lead herb. In formula making, you've got like four categories of herbs, the emperor and then the assistant emperor, whatever you want to call it, and then the ministers and then the um, messenger or carrier. Let's see, so licorice, and then we started in the blood tonics, and some of them I've already gotten out. Most of these we can also grow. Uh, that's one of the Solomon seals, and that's been processed in wine. That's why it looks so sticky and goopy. And this Shu Di Wang, the false uh, fox glove, has also been processed in wine. It's big lumps, very sticky. The Husha Wu, <coughs> Polygonum multiflorum, quite a strong growing plant. Uh, the medicinal part of big tubers that grow on the roots, and this has been processed in uh, decoction of black beans to get it like this. And a whole story about that. This is supposed to be good for uh, keeping your hair black, and in fact, the name of it means black-haired Mr. Huh, Hushowu. In English, it's often called Fo Tea, which is a meaningless phrase in Chinese. Uh, so the whole idea of keeping your hair black, so it's processed in black soybeans. There's a lot of symbolic stuff going on, uh, which turns the herb black. It doesn't really keep your hair going from going gray when you get to be 60. But if your hair is turning gray when you're 30, you got a liver or kidney deficiency, and that's what this herb is good for. Uh, also, a big blood tonic is these goji berries. We're going to use those here. Mulberries, uh, different kinds of fruit. Then we're going to get into the yang tonics. A lot of these we can't grow here. They're kind of exotic. The biggest yang tonic is deer antler, actually. And one of the biggest yin tonics is turtle shells. They're kind of complementary to each other in a way. Epimedium, which is called yin yang huo. This is starting to show up uh, in gas station truck stops and so on right there at the counter called horny goat weed. It's in the Chinese medicinal part of your truck stop right next to the ma huang, the ephedra, and the uh, ginseng. Look for it, horny goat weed. So it's a yang tonic. It's uh, reproductive energy is associated with the kidney. So kidney yang tonics are what old men take. Uh, the Chinese have a lot of experience with that because some of the best brains in the Chinese emperor for se empire for several thousand years worked at trying to keep the emperor sexually active because that's what he wanted and what he said went. So they put a lot of energy into figuring that one out. But in fact, a lot of these yang, yang tonics are used by menopausal women as well. It's just a hormone balancing kind of thing. Uh, let's see. So as I said, a number of these we can't grow. They're kind of tropical or whatever. I've tried them all. Fenugreek we can grow sometimes as an annual. Uh, there's a couple of fern roots here. This one, Dipsicus, is a Chinese teasel. That's the number one herb for broken bones. goes into a lot of martial arts formulas. 
the martial arts folks, they have formulas for kind of bodybuilding, you know, building up energy and muscle, but they also have a very, very sophisticated bunch of formulas for repairing broken something because they're always beating each other up, right? So they got formula for the spear wound to the shoulder, formula for a club wound to the elbow, all these specific <laughs> formulas for how you treat these injuries. But they got a lot of great broken bone formulas. And I just showed someone a book on Chinese sports medicine, which draws on that tradition. Yeah, if any of you have any kind of problems like that, tendons, ligaments, muscles, bones, there's a lot of great information in there. We'll be using this one in Will's formula too. So that's one we can grow. The uh, teasel. Cuscuta is kind of interesting. That's uh, dodder. I don't know what dodder is. You know, like a parasitic vine, like yellow thread draped all over everything. Maybe it doesn't go down into the Piedmont. It is a flowering plant, but it behaves like a parasite. That's the seeds of that. Uh, then, anyways, moving right along, lily bulbs is another one that we could put in any kind of food you were making. There's another Solomon seal here. A number of these we can grow. Then it gets down into uh, astringents uh, that cause shrinkage of tissue and they also prevent leakage. There's a concept of your chi or your jing, your vital essence, leaking away and so some of these herbs prevent that from happening. That would include shizandra and dogwood fruit and prunus mume fruit and a few others. And then the last big category is calm the heart and settle the spirit. And these are all sedatives of different kinds. A lot of them are minerals. You can think of sedation as like heaviness, as like bringing down, you know, calming down. So again, this, this metaphorical thinking, and these are, tend to be heavy things. Some of them are even mineral ores like magnetite and uh, iron oxide, but a lot of them are shells, different kinds of seashells, oyster shell. Uh, let's see, a big one used to be cinnabar, but nobody wants to go near that anymore. That's mercuric sulfate or something, which they say they know how to use it safely, but everybody's scared to death of it. This is dragon bone here. This will be in the one of the formulas we're going to make. There's dragon bone and dragon tooth. Actually, we're going to use the dragon tooth. And these are fossilized bones that are dug out of a couple of particular mountainsides in China. They're thought to be primarily mastodon fossils. It's kind of fun. Huh? Is that for the knee? No, no, that's going to be for the brain formula. Okay. A lot of these uh, sedative ones go to the heart, and they're going to be in your uh, formula for uh, overstudy. So it's not like they're, they're not sedative in the way of putting you to sleep by any means. It's all about tonifying the heart, really. Uh, a couple of them that we, that we can grow around here is mimosa, that weedy tree with the pink flowers. Very important in Chinese medicine, uh, the bark and the flowers. And it's thought to be particularly good for heartbreak and, you know, tragedy and people that are just shattered by, emotionally by some kind of experience. A lot of Western herbalists are starting to use that herb anymore. All right, here we are back out on the deck, and I want to talk about the two things that we're going to make here. Uh, and one of them is a formula for Will's knee, or anybody else that has a bad knee could probably mm -hmm. prevail on him for a trial sample. Mm -hmm. So this is called uh, pubescent angelica and taxilis decoction, which is a kind of boring name. It's also called solitary hermit tea pills, commercially. <laughs> and so I offered under that name. And uh, so I have it made up in tincture form. You all can taste it. Just take a few drops or however much you want. And here's a description of it. Heavy and painful sensations at fixed locations in lower back and lower extremities, accompanied by weakness and stiffness or hypertonicity and immobility and aversion to cold and attraction to warmth, palpitation, shortness of breath, pale tongue with a white coating, there may also be numbness. This is painful obstruction with liver and kidney deficiency. Lower back and lower extremities are the province of the kidneys. Knees are the province of the sinews and are therefore associated with the liver. And it goes on. Uh, so that's the formula that we want to make here. We picked out. We'll try a couple different things. This seemed like the best one. 
So these are, we can look, look briefly at the herbs that are in this. It's a pretty elaborate formula. Uh, so let's see, we've got a number of yang tonics for that kidney yin deficiency they talked about. This is dujong, hardy rubber tree. Eucomia almoides. It's in Michael Durr's book, and there used to be a very nice one at uh, the Ralston Arboretum, but I think it disappeared a few years ago when certain, it was right next to the parking a lot, uh, the old parking yeah. lot. You can see the rubber in it. It actually does have rubber. It looks like snake skin. But, uh, so that's an important uh, kidney yang tonic. We're going to use that. And also this uh, What they're calling Taxillus sangjisheng. This is a kind of mistletoe that grows on mulberry, another important yang tonic. Mulberries uh, provide five different herbs for five different purposes in Chinese medicine. The uh, fruit has tonic properties, and the leaves, and the twigs, and the bark on the roots. They all do different things. Uh, and then the fifth one is this parasite that can grow on mulberry. So you can see it's little bits of wood and also leaf from that. Another herb that's in here is a very warming one, Shi Shin. This is probably equivalent to what's of known as wild ginger up here, Asarum canadense. And we might just go over and grab a little Asarum canadense over here to mingle in uh, with this, just to get some sort of fresh herb energy. This is very heating. This is in the category of release the exterior. And so is this one, Fang Feng, the commander of the wind. This goes into most formulas for early stages of colds and so on. But in this case, it's wind damp that's being addressed. That's one of the terms for rheumatism or arthritis is a wind damp condition. So we've got some of these anti-wind herbs. Du Huo is uh, Chinese angelica. That's well naturalized down in my garden. Uh, but at this, this isn't really the right time of year to harvest it, so we'll just go with this Chinese material. But we do want to go down in the garden and harvest. Oops, should be here. Oh, it's not here because we're going to harvest it. Uh, Acaranthes bidentata, oxni, which is an herb uh, in the category of circulate the blood, so it would help with pain. Uh, but it also is known to direct the energy of the herbs to the lower extremities and particularly to the knees. So you have different uh, herbs in Chinese medicine that can carry a prescription to a certain part of the body. Like I mentioned, the thing about kudzu and the neck, shoulders. That's a, it can be used to direct any remedy where you have neck shoulder issues going on or as a side effect symptom, whatever. This is the uh, Dangwe, the Chinese Angelica, the big one for women's reproductive system I mentioned, or just for blood. It's both a blood tonic and a blood mover, this one. It does both of the blood things. And this part, which is called the head, is thought to be more tonifying. This part, which is the tails, is thought to be more blood moving. So what we're going to be putting in here into this formula is some of this, which is mostly the tails, and they've been fried in wine for the reasons I mentioned earlier, to help promote the circulation to the extremities particularly. So we made up a batch of this, and then I just stick it in here when I need it. And then the other important blood tonic that we discussed was the peony root, common garden peony. That's right here, and we also have some wine fried of that, which we'll put in. And this one, Chuan Xiong, the lovage that I mentioned, that's related to the Osha root out west, Ligusticum Chuan Xiong. Interesting thing about this plant is it never makes seeds. You have to propagate it vegetatively. There's some growing right in front of the lower greenhouse. At certain points along the stem, it makes a little ring of kind of callus tissue, and if you push that into the ground, it'll root at that point and make a new plant. So who knows what the botanical story is with that, just like maybe some fluke that happened at some point in time and it was recognized, because now it all has to be propagated from the original uh, plants. 
Some of these have quite strong flavors, which you'll get acquainted with as we work with them. Uh, but this, we have some wine fried chuanxiang, so we'll use that too if we have enough. Then cinnamon bark, which is very warming. This is really good cinnamon. Although it's not the best, the best cinnamon costs three hundred dollars a pound or more. The really good stuff from you know really old trees in Vietnam. Most of the cinnamon that we get in America isn't really the true cinnamon that's used medicinally. And I like to keep it whole. It's it's taken in ground form. If this is in a prescription, it's usually I give it to them separate in a little packet, and they stir it in at the end. With a lot of these aromatic things, you can't cook them very long or you'll lose, like mint. Mint you put in at the last five minutes of cooking. Uh, cinnamon it could be the same, or you could just stir the powder into your finished product and drink it. So we'll try and bash that up. That'll be somebody's job, and we could maybe use the coffee grinder. So that's most of the herbs that are in here. Ginseng is in here also. So actually all... No, not quite. Only three out of the four of the four gentlemen are in here, because this is poria, the giant underground mushroom. And three out of four of the uh, of the blood tonics are in here, too. A lot of the, uh, the way a practitioner will work commonly is he'll use these ancient formulas as building blocks. And he or she will focus on one or two of those. They might take two formulas and combine them. And then they'll adjust the numbers according to the patient and then you know they might add a few other herbs to address certain side symptoms or whatever for instance an adjustment on this one was uh, modifications for severe pain add agkistrodon well that's a snake we haven't got that and safflower, that we do have. That was the bright red flower. So we could throw that in. For severe cold, add such and such. For severe dampness, add such and such. For signs of only mild deficiency, remove such and such. For the sequel of poliomyelitis, add such and such. So th there's different ways that the formulas are adjusted. That's the great thing about using the herbs. Most practitioners, especially people trained in acupuncture, if they use herbs, it's usually in the form of pills. They get better patient compliance. Uh, they're easier to take, and most of the classic formulas are available, but they lose the ability to fine-tune the formula to the patient, unfortunately. So the second thing we're going to do is make these pills. I sent around a sample of pills. We're going to make a different pill called Bu Nao Wan, Tonify the Brain Pill. Nourishes the heart, tonifies blood, tonifies kidney, resolves stagnation, subdues yang, calms shen. Used for deficiency of blood and yin, affecting memory, concentration, and alertness. Can be used for insomnia, restlessness, palpitation, anxiety, or vivid, uncomfortable dreaming. It has been a favorite in acupuncture schools by students mentally exhausted by too much study and is used to fortify the brain for examinations. All right. <laughs> So I made up a big batch of this, about 800 grams, which still means with this many people, I'm afraid you're not going to get a huge amount to take home, but you can save it for emergency conditions. <laughs> and one of the things we're going to want to do is sift through here uh, and get out some of the chunky material. That'll be a job. Get it not so lumpy, and then the way we make the pills is we combine this with honey, where we actually cook the honey for a little while to cook some of the water out of it, which makes the honey stickier uh, and better able to bond. And then we're just going to work up a nice, knead it to a nice consistency. It's usually about equal weight of honey and herbs, but it varies according to how sticky or not sticky the herbs might be. We're just going to work it into a nice dough, roll it out with a rolling pin, cut it into slices, make nice little snakes like you did when you were in kindergarten, mm -hmm. chop those into pieces, roll those into balls, and then there's a way you can coat them so they don't all stick together, like, like the pills I passed around earlier. You make a coating with a tiny bit of oil and a few shavings of beeswax in it, roll them around in that, and then bake them in a slow oven overnight. And they Harden up real nice so you can carry them around in your pocket. Uh, so I could pass this around. We might or might not get to making all this into pills. Uh, 
which really kind of doesn't matter. I mean, you could just have a lump of this and tear off little pieces and chew them when you want it to. You know, the pills are just kind of a convenience thing. So we'll see how far we get with pill making. But if you want to taste it, you can just take a pinch of it and see what it tastes like. And I'll talk a little bit about the herbs that are in there, and then we'll get started on doing Joe, this. Joe, one thing. question. On, uh, if, we, if we take a lump, does that need to be uh, refrigerated, or it's just room temperature is fine? I would refrigerate it. Re refrigerate Room temperature probably would be fine. Honey is a good preservative. Uh -huh. But why not refrigerate it? Right. You know, just to right. keep it right. for longer. Because okay. the herbs, after all, have been powdered. As mm -hmm. I said, that's immediately opening them up to being oxidized right. and so on. Uh, but pastes, flavored pastes, are called electuaries, have been often been used as a vehicle for delivering medicine, and very big in Ayurvedic medicine. They have a wonderful one called Chaiwan Prash, which is just delicious. It's made of honey and clarified butter and then about uh, 75 different herbs. Ouch. Actually, I should have brought some. I'll, I can pass some of that around later on. You can spread it on bread, you can whatever, and it tastes really <coughs> yummy. Uh, not so well developed in Chinese medicine, but one certainly could. I was talking to my students just last week about the possibilities of working up something using the tonic herbs, some kind of delicious thing like that. So some of the other herbs, some of the same herbs are going to be in this formula that are in wills. But there are a number of herbs for uh, the heart or the spirit because this uh, problem is a heart uh, issue. Uh, calm the heart and settle the spirit. You know, the heart is, works with the brain. I, actually, in Chinese medicine, they think of the heart as the source of thinking. For them, the brain is one of the extraordinary organs, and it's called the sea of marrow. It's interesting. Sea of marrow. Yeah. <laughs> and marrow is also very, very, very important, as we know. It's like where everything gets right. made. Uh, but those are extraordinary organs. So they think of thinking as a, emanating from the heart. So some of the other ingredients that are in here are some that are important for the heart, polygola senega, and this one we treated with licorice juice. We made a decoction of licorice to eliminate, a, this has a little bit of a side effect of irritating the throat, so you can neutralize that with the licorice. As I mentioned, it's good for food poisoning. Another very big herb that's used for reducing any kind of toxicity is ginger. And both of those herbs, licorice and ginger, are anti-nausea, anti-emetic herbs, ginger especially. Very, very powerful for uh, anti-nausea. Another thing that's really good for anti-nausea is first aid is to scratch an orange and sniff it. Any of you ever done that? Which is interesting because most of the herbs in the category regulate the chi are orange peels. There's four different kinds of orange peels used, two different species of orange, and then whether it's green or whether it's ripe. And they all have slightly different discriminations as to how they're used. So the polygola is in the category of uh, heart medicine. So is the bizarin, the seeds of uh, either, it's all the same thing, Thuya orientalis, uh, platycladus, something or other. What do they call it nowadays? Does anybody know? Oriental Arborvita, and it was called Biata for a while. Mm -hmm. Those are the three general. <laughs> Sometimes common names are better. Don't, don't let them kid you with this Latin name stuff. They can be even more confusing than common names. Uh, Shazandra, which is starting to get pretty well known in the West. This is delicious stuff. I still haven't gotten fruit. Fresh fruit of this is absolutely delicious. Wu so means five flavored tea. This is thought to have all five flavors, three in the fruit and two in the seeds. So you usually grind the seeds up with the fruit. It's a little hard and chunky. I mean, if anyone wants to suck on one for a while, you're welcome to. The, the fresh one is the one that's really, I think you could make a million wonderful drink products from this <laughs> stuff. And it is beginning to be go, grown commercially. Uh, it's difficult as dioecia, you need a male and a female, and it tends to bloom too early for me. Schwanzaren is the number one herb for insomnia, which is just thought to be a heart disturbance again. It's a little tree that's growing right next to the solar panels. It's a kind of jujube, uh, thorny jujubes. This is it's jujuba variety spinosa. These look, seeds look like little lentils. Mm -hmm. And they taste quite good. And you can just grind them up and, and take them as a draft, like stir it into hot water and 
uh, 10 minutes before bedtime. Sometimes helps a lot. Tastes like Ovaltine. Not bad at all. Uh, we've got amber in here, Hupo. And we've got the dragon tooth, which I mentioned. Those are both in this heart category. Shirchang Pu is the Chinese uh, calamus. I, I think I mentioned calamus, sweet flag down near the bog. Number one rejuvenative for the brain in Indian medicine. Very important herb. American Indians use it for endurance and appetite suppression, much the way uh, coca leaf was used in the Andes. Like when they wanted to do endurance running or something, they would chew on this stuff. Certain local folks chew on calamus root. It's a strong, spicy, uh, it's an appealing flavor, but it's strong and spicy. Uh, this is the Chinese version. Now, in Chinese thinking, this is for uh, reducing phlegm. So there's this idea of phlegm as this kind of misty stuff that circulates around in your body and isn't really too desirable in most cases. So there's phlegm as a cough, but there's also phlegm which can clog the orifices, is the way they <laughs> express it. And it can, can clog your brain, too. <laughs> So what you're trying to do is get that brain unclogged, and this one kind of is this aromatic herb that just cuts through that, that phlegm mist. And then if the phlegm stays around too long, it can condense into nodules and eventually become cancerous or, or ulcers or whatever. That's the way they think about it. Uh, Tien Ma is an orchid that grows uh, almost parasitically on a mushroom called armillaria that you might be familiar with, the one that kills uh, landscape material. It has the black, ropey thing. So they've worked out how to cultivate this stuff. It's incredibly complicated how that's grown. Uh, so yeah, those are just a few of the additional herbs. So as I said, in a lot of these, in both of the formulas, there's some herbs that are going to be used in both cases. So this one we got already ground up. And we're just ready to get this sifted out and then mix in the honey and mess around with making some pills. This one here, we've got to weigh out the herbs for the formula. So we'll get a scale out here. We've actually got two scales. Two people could get on getting this weighed out. And then we want to collect two things to add for it. Uh, the, the acaranthes root, the ox knee. We'll go down in the garden and look for a couple of nice ones of that. Get them washed off, chopped up. And then we want to get a little bit of wild ginger. That'll be right over here to add to that. And then we'll get those, uh, once those are weighed out, we want to break the pieces up as small as possible so they'll extract really well. And then we'll measure out the alcohol. Typically for a dried herb formula, the, uh, the formula for a tincture is one to five, 50% alcohol. So that means one part of herbs to five parts of liquid, if you're using grams, it works out nice, grams to milliliters, or you can do uh, weight ounces to liquid ounces, either way. So we're going to weigh out, I think I decided on 400 grams of herbs, or is that too much? Maybe 300. So if we use 300 grams of herbs total, then we would use 1,500 milliliters of alcohol and I buy Everclear which is 95 percent. We're going to dilute it halfway to 50 percent, 100 proof and just put the herbs in there and then he's going to shake it every day for a couple of weeks and then he can start using it. Eventually we would press it out using a tincture press we have in here. Should be ten. So you're trying to make it thirty four, right? Yes. You want twenty four, right? So do you want I'm saying the initial make it or the initial breaking of them kinda of makes them fly everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> or should I
to get that Lindsay. We will end up having to spend it's not all of the food to get our meat packed together. Uh, no. mm. And that's four inch pipe to stick it in. Yeah, I think that maybe we missed that. I think I thought the honey would be thicker. Yeah. Do you want some more in there? Yeah. You've been sitting on there. I've been sitting like on benches or on the steps or, you know, it's like. And it's the water that makes it so thick. But this might work just fine, and these would be totally neutral uh, ingredients that wouldn't affect you know, the action of it at all. So heat would affect it, right? Heat would, mm -hmm. heat would affect the properties, probably? Mm -hmm. No, not necessarily. No, well, it depends on how much heat you're talking about. When I make the pills, I bake them overnight in a okay. slow oven of about 115 right. degrees. Mm -hmm. I put a little coating on them with beeswax, and that keeps them right. from sticking um, together. So you do do a drying, like on the second. So a little bit it's of heat. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm, I wouldn't try and bake it. I don't think there'd be a... I think by the time you bake the moisture out, the moisture being honey, you'd have really cooked, cooked them a lot. Too much. Uh, so it would take a long a time. Yeah. You make it, you could almost do a cracker yeah. that way, yep. like under lip at really low heat for a while. You want it, you know, where, where if you put a rolling pin over it, it's not going to just stick to the rolling pin. It's <laughs> kind of going to spread out. Yeah. Yeah, trick or treat. <laughs> Okay, so here we are at the end of our workshop today, and this is what we made. Uh, we did the pills, the honey pills uh, from the Bunawan, the Tonify the Brain, or Healthy Brain, it's called, translated into English. Uh, it came out pretty well. We got it a little too moist at the beginning, and we had to add some corn flour to thicken it up, and then we coated them with a mixture of a little bit of beeswax uh, dissolved in hot olive oil. And then we just rolled them around in that to give them a slight coating. Then I'm going to bake them at a very low temperature overnight and they'll come out nice and hard and crunchy like those if you want to grab that bottle right, right up there. These are obviously much smaller, uh, but you can see they get nice and baked and dry and hard, and they kind of rattle together, which these ones don't do at the moment. Uh, so that's what we're shooting for. These are nice big pills because we had a lot to work with. So these are actually the, that size is about four grams, which is a typical dosage. Although dosage isn't super precise on these things. You can go a little over, a little under. As I said, these are very safe herbs. And then we prepared this tincture of the Angelica and Loranthus formula, the uh, mulberry mistletoe, also called the solitary hermit formula. And we used uh, some fresh herbs to supplement the Chinese herbs that we have. Particularly, we used fresh acaranthes, which is a key herb for the knees. We want to direct this herb to the knees, and the acaranthes will help it do that. So these we are going to agitate every day for uh, ideally a month. Mm -hmm. Although after only two weeks, you could start drawing off of here. And then uh, at some point in the future, we'll press them to get all the liquid out. But after a month, you could decant off everything and then try as best you can to squeeze the rest. Okay, but Joe, you were suggesting that Put um, some more, go go for a second shot yeah, at it? Yeah, I would. Okay. I would on I, a lot I of these tonic will. herbs. And even when you're decocting, a lot of times you'll do it three times. Really? Like this ginseng. Uh -huh. uh, some okay. of these dense roots. Right. They figure the second out of the three is sometimes the best. Really? Okay. And the third is a little weaker again. So mm -hmm. That's a typical way to do Chinese wines. You see a lot of different recipes. Some of them will say an ounce to a gallon. Uh-huh. Uh, this is considerably stronger than that. This is a one to five ratio. So for, uh, I think there's uh, 200 grams of herbs in here and 1,000 milliliters of 100 proof alcohol. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. what we did, and we learned a lot <laughs> about okay. how to do it better next time. <laughs> okay. Which we uh, always do. Questions or comments? Well, thank you for the work. Uh, you did a great job, folks.